Anger is a complex emotion, and while it's one that many of us, if not most of us, are quite familiar with, it is not one that we usually associate with our Lord Jesus. No, when we think of our Lord and the portrait of him that is given to us in the gospel, we do not think of Jesus as being an angry man. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, Paul says, Get angry, but do not let the sun set on your anger. In this way, you give no opportunity to the devil. And we can be sure that when our Lord laid his head down to rest at night, his mind wasn't racing with angry thoughts about his adversaries, nor was his heart filled with bitterness as he plotted revenge against his enemies. But our Lord did get angry at times, and there were indeed occasions when his own disciples felt the sting of some rather hard words. Think, for example, of the time that our Lord was speaking to the disciples about his approaching passion and death. And Peter protested, God forbid that any such thing should ever happen to you, Lord. Jesus turned to him angrily and he said, Get behind me, you Satan. No doubt Peter felt the sting of those words. And yet there is perhaps no incident in the gospel that matches the depth of emotion or the display of anger that our Lord showed on the day that he fashioned a whip made out of cords and he used it to drive the money changers from the temple. St. John tells us that our Lord was in Jerusalem at that time to celebrate the Passover feast. Now you may have noticed today we have once again the image of the face of Jesus on the mantelpiece of our ambo. This image, as you probably realize, is taken from the Shroud of Turin, the burial cloth of Jesus, and it shows the face of the suffering Christ. The Christ whose countenance was wounded and disfigured by the blows which he received on the day that he carried the cross through the streets of Jerusalem. On that day, our Lord did not exhibit anger, nor did he shield himself from the blows and the curses that he received. This was to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 53 concerning God's suffering servant. I gave my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who plucked my beard, my face I did not shield from buffets and spitting. In today's gospel, however, St. John shows us another side of the face of our Lord Jesus Christ, and it is the face of righteous anger and even of divine wrath. We see Jesus fashioning a whip made of cords and then using the lash to drive out the merchants who were selling animals destined for sacrifice in the temple precincts. We see Jesus overturning tables and sending bags of money flying into the air. St. John makes the comment, his disciples recalled the words of Scripture in Psalm 69, zeal for your house will consume me. Yes, this is what consumed the heart of Jesus that day. Not only righteous anger, which would pass, but an abiding zeal for the holiness of God, reverence for the Lord's dwelling place on earth. And I want to stop here for a moment and reflect with you on the nature of zeal. In his Summa, St. Thomas Aquinas tells us that zeal is one of the moral virtues. If you trace the root meaning of the word zeal in Greek, it means to be hot or to bring something to a boil. As a virtue, Aquinas says that zeal flows from the intensity of love. Zeal flows from the intensity of love. Of love. 
It is the flame that arises from the fire of God's own love. The virtue of zeal cannot abide an offense against God, nor can it brook an unjust assault against our neighbor whom we are called to love. This is why the psalmist speaks of a consuming, a consuming zeal for the Lord's house. And in the lives of the saints, we see their powerful zeal for the salvation of souls. You know, when I think about Father Mark Beard, the word that comes to mind that describes him best is zealous. Father Mark could be very fiery in his preaching, but it came from an intense love for God and a burning desire for the salvation of souls. The temple in Jerusalem was sacred to Jesus because it was holy to God, his almighty Father. Remember when our Lord was 12 years old and he'd gone up to Jerusalem with his parents to celebrate the Passover feast. When the feast concluded, Joseph and Mary realized that they couldn't find Jesus and they spent three whole days searching for him. Three days that prefigured the three days he would spend in the tomb. When they did find him in the temple, Mary said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? And our Lord answered her very simply, Did you not know that I must be in my Father's house? Indeed, our Lord revered the temple as the dwelling place of God in the midst of his people. For a thousand years before our Lord's time, the temple in Jerusalem had stood on Mount Moriah, the mountain where the patriarch Abraham had once been tested by God to sacrifice his beloved son Isaac. And even though Isaac's life was spared, God did not spare his own son. It was on the same mount that David, King David, announced his intention to build a house for God. But that privilege was given to Solomon, David's son. On the mount, Solomon built a magnificent temple, and he erected an altar made of stone. It was there on that altar that the priests of the temple, each and every day, offered sacrifice to God. And now this temple, the dwelling place of God, had been defiled by the presence of men who cared nothing for God, but only for the coins in their belts and purses. The silver coins they collected reminded Jesus of the 30 pieces of silver that one day would be given to Judas to betray him. On this day, however, our Lord cleansed the temple of these sinful men. And he also prophesied to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. St. John says no one understood what he meant by those words in that moment. But our Lord was revealing that he was now the true temple of God. For in him dwelt God's eternal Son. And though his body would be destroyed by sinful men on the cross. He would rise on the, th on the third day. St. Paul goes on to make an extraordinary claim in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, when he says, we ourselves in our own bodies have become temples of God's Holy Spirit through baptism into Christ. In Ephesians 4, Paul also says that we must do nothing to grieve the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. We can have no part of the spirit of fornication or mortal sin because now we belong to Christ. Our bodies have been purchased and redeemed and cleansed by him. At this Mass, when we come forward, to receive our Lord in Holy Communion, we become living tabernacles of his presence. And with the help of divine grace, 
he calls us to obey the commandments that we have received from God, as we heard in that powerful reading from Exodus today. In this way, we become pleasing to him. My friends, the season of Lent, these 40 days, are a time for temple cleansing, a time when Christ asks us to let his Holy Spirit drive from the temple of our bodies whatever is offensive or displeasing to God our Heavenly Father. This is the purpose of the threefold discipline that we undertake with the help of the Holy Spirit, namely fasting, prayer, and almsgiving. Paul says in the letter to the Romans, chapter 12, verse 1, offer your bodies to the Lord as a pleasing sacrifice to him. And let zeal for God consume you. I close today with the words of the Anima Christi, the beautiful prayer that we will sing at the close of communion today. Soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, inebriate me. Water from the side of Christ, wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. O oh, good Jesus, hear me. Within your wounds, hide me. Permit me not to be separated from you. From the wicked foe, defend me. At the hour of my death, call me and bid me come to you, that with your saints I may praise you forever and ever. Amen.